watershed and how much of that fixed carbon is actually processed in stream. Um, they estimated in this paper uh, that uh, around 35 to 50 percent of the macromolecules of carbon, including lignin and cellulose, so carbon compounds that are typically more recalcitrant to degradation, that they were consumed for fueling aquatic metabolism in the Amazon. While we're trying to understand how much carbon is processed um, in continental waters um, and how much of that then makes it to the coast, we also are challenged by the fact that nitrogen is globally uh, mobilized through human activities, as is phosphorus, but our reserves for phosphorus globally are dwindling. I don't know if all of you are aware of that, but there's a global phosphorus shortage. Um, so it's very important for us to understand the balance between carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which are fundamental to ecosystems, um, but how the uh, stoichiometric imbalance of those elements causes ecosystems to shift in their functionality and make predictions about future, uh, future global changes where nitrogen is more abundant and phosphorus is relatively less abundant. So as much as we've studied freshwater low or flowing systems like, like rivers, this is a, um, a dendritic map of headwater streams, and this is a network map of the Coweta Basin, Coweta LTER in North Carolina, we know a lot about small rivers, those rivers and streams that we can step across, that we can manipulate, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about those, because um, that's where Coweta is. But albeit that we know a lot about those rivers, their complexity and variation is quite large, as you can see from just the spatial variation on this map. Um, and a lot of these rivers don't even show up on maps. So um, this is where rivers begin in the headwaters, and they are very dynamic systems. They're not always flowing at the same rates. Um, sometimes the canopy is closed. Um, this is deciduous forest, eastern US. Sometimes the canopy is open. So they're very dynamic systems in their process rates um, of carbon. And we were trying to assess that more specifically in terms of carbon processes relative to nitrogen and phosphorus availability, um, which I'm going to talk to you about today specifically. So this is one of my study systems from my PhD. This is Ball Creek in the Southern Appalachians in December. Um, it's still shaded mostly because there's an understory of rhododendron, but there's lots of organic matter in the forms of form of leaf litter and terrestrial organic matter that comes into these systems, which are otherwise pretty uh, low productivity. They don't fix a lot or produce a lot of energy. And so a lot of systems that have been studied, um, this is net ecosystem production on the y-axis, in time on the X. A lot of them will show a diel variation or hump in production with light and photosynthesis occurring during the day, respiration dominating at night. Well, in Coweta and a lot of forested systems that don't have a lot of light, even seasonally, we see just flat lines. So these are net heterotrophic systems. And so what, what other people might look at in terms of change in DO, we don't have a change in DO in these systems, but we have a relative heterotrophy, a relative uh, uh, ecosystem respiration rate that's higher or lower depending on temperature, flow, and as we'll talk in a little bit of, about carbon and nutrient availabilities. So we're really interested in these systems that are net heterotrophic, that consume terrestrial carbon, we're really interested in understanding how low can they go in terms of heterotrophic respiration, how net heterotrophic can they get before they start to consume their carbon base. Because they're not producing a lot of carbon. So Walter Dodds and a group um, put together this conceptual figure that talks about uh, trophic state in, in ecosystems, but specifically related to ecosystem respiration rate. Um, so the drivers, the larger scale 
drivers or the fundamental drivers are carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, those inorganic nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus. The type of and amount of alokthenes, which is external or terrestrial, versus internal or autochthenes produced carbon, biofilms, algae. How much of that's removed from consumers or just disturbance, physical disturbance and export? Um, how much of those, how much of that carbon and nutrients is processed, uh, stimulating secondary consumer production and biomass? And then the net effect on ecosystem respiration rate. So today I'm going to focus more on the endpoints, but these are the mechanisms, the biogeochemistry of the mechanisms. How do the biofilms, the heterotrophic and autotrophic biofilms respond to carbon and nutrient availability? And what's the net effect on ecosystem respiration rate? So to put things in perspective, um, our research team went to the NAQA, the National Water Quality Assessment from the US Geological Survey, went to their database that was recently updated this year to look at what is, they have total and total nitrogen and total phosphorus, but we were focusing on dissolved um, DIN and SRP, soluble reactive phosphorus. What's the distribution of water quality in the United States to kind of put in perspective where we are? These axes, these scales are huge mm -hmm. in terms of, in fact, that's cut off at the end, that's 40,000 on the Y for DIN micrograms per liter. Um, up to, in some cases, nearly 10,000 micrograms per liter phosphorus. As you'll see in the next slide, these are land use images on the, on the uh, right side of the screen. There are clear drivers of mostly agriculture and some urban influences that drive those high levels of NMP concentrations. So what I did is just pull out land use, because that database has a nice proxy, it, it's a, categorized by land use type, and then looked at the molar ratio, because I'm interested in nitrogen and phosphorus ratios. So these lines here represent molar ratios that we used in our study as um, target ratios to assess ecosystem function along an NMP uh, gradient. And so the ag is really dominated by nitrogen with some high phosphorus, and that's just really due to fertilizer use. Um, the urban has more of a balanced NMP enrichment, but a lot of this higher P is, is sewage outflow. And the forested, much shorter range, nitrogen going up to just around 1,000 in most cases, and around 500 for phosphorus. And reference is, is similar to that. Um, so we focused in on reference systems where DIN was ranging in, on a national scale around um, 0 to 3,000 relative to phosphorus around uh, 0 to 200. So What's the definition of a reference system? Reference systems are contentiously defined, um, but this database defined it as just one that's not disturbed. It's not logged, it's higher in the watershed. Um, but you could argue that there are no reference systems. So, but it's it's really just an unimpacted like national forest, yeah, or national grassland. Good question. So, as I mentioned, we're focusing on the N to P ratios. Um, as you can imagine, these dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations vary but their ratio is very less. And so when you're in a system um, and you're trying to treat it with nutrients, you can maintain concentrations less easily than you can ratios. So for the drivers of, of carbon loss in systems that are exposed to nutrient dynamics, we really were testing the concentrations, as you'll see next, but really also the ratios of N to P. Um, the effects or the, the pathways or mechanisms were um, predicted to be increased metabolism through microbes. Microbes are the ones that are first taking up those nutrients. Um, they lead to increased ecosystem respiration, uh, increased carbon loss because these are systems that are net heterotrophic, they don't produce 
as much carbon as they consume, so they're reliant on that loading of carbon from the terrestrial landscape. And that these would be notable as changes in carbon to nitrogen, carbon to phosphorus, or nitrogen to phosphorus ratios of organic matter. And I'm just going to focus on the carbon to nitrogen and carbon to phosphorus ratios today. Um, and these mechanisms could be uh, further explored and are being further explored in our project as uh, shifts between resource and consumer stoichiometry. So consumers have demands for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and sometimes those demands are flexible, and sometimes those demands are fixed. Resources are either flexible or fixed in terms of their stoichiometry, and so part of our group is trying to understand how variable is that stoichiometric resource base, and how flexible are the consumers, the invertebrates, and larval salamanders that rely on that resource base. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the carbon characteristics, the loss of detritus or leaf terrestrial organic matter, and we actually have some interesting insights into increases in biofilm, and then some of the changes in the carbon to nutrient ratios uh, that limit consumer growth. That's something I won't talk about today, but that's a larger um, uh, measurement that our study group is, is focusing on. So this is our stream channels because, um, as I mentioned, it's really hard to maintain concentrations in whole systems, uh, but you can pretty well in uh, mesocosms. So this is sort of the Taj Mahal of stream channels. Um, we're pumping from a nearby stream into a head tank and then gravity feeding it into uh, 30 channels. Um, and at the top, you can see uh, little elbows where the water's coming in. We also were dripping nutrients in at the top of that. So we loaded these channels, they're literally just gutters, um, with different types of organic matter and um, fine mesh was what we were focusing on. We were trying to exclude larger consumers and focus on microbial responses. And our question was generally, what are the effects of detritus or terrestrial organic matter carbon quality um, when it's been enriched with nitrogen and phosphorus and how does how do the microbes that break that down respond differently to N versus P with a fast breakdown leaf versus a slow breakdown leaf. So we used two dominant riparian tree species leaves, red maple and rhododendron that waxy understory. What are we looking at at the, uh, the foreground exactly on the surface of the what is this? Of the water. The oranges. Yeah. <laughs> These are uh, Toby I think I know, but I don't they're, well they're called Toby T boys, but they're just um, they're fine mesh enclosures. Uh-huh. Um, okay, that's and, what I'm talking about. And these are this is window screen. So inside of these, um, those are two size fractions, one millimeter versus two fifty micrometer and they're just one really excludes inverts and the other. I thought they were cultures. I just yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, they're kind of funky. Fun. So our treatment experimental design looked like this in terms of dissolved nitrogen, dissolved phosphorus, and we had five levels of N and five levels of phosphorus. And these numbers correspond to the N to P molar ratios. So what's kind of cool is along the middle, we had red field ratio N to P 16 to 1, and we had N to P less than 16 to 1 above that, and N to P greater than 16 to 1 above that. So we can, although we're manipulating concentrations, we can also assess the relative impacts on N to P ratios or up N to P ratios on carbon loss. Okay, so this picture, this figure I'm going to walk through, it's got um, breakdown rates per day on the y-axis. This is red maple, the first box. The points are in blue, which might be a little bit difficult to see. And figure B is red uh, rhododendron, points in black. Um, x-axis is nitrogen, and the z-axis, let's say, is um, phosphorus. And these are log, uh, log axes, except for breakdown rates. 
And the general <coughs> take home message here is that for every level of nitrogen, we can assess an impact of increasing phosphorus on breakdown rates. And for every level of phosphorus, we can look at the increasing concentration of nitrogen on breakdown rates. So we could constrain varying P or keeping P constant and varying N or keeping N constant and varying P because we have this crossed gradient design. What we basically find, you can see the rates are much higher for, for uh, red maple than for uh, rhododendron. And that for a given amount, for keeping N constant for a given amount of P, um, or sorry, varying N for a given amount of P, we increase maple breakdown rates by 0 0.002, um, uh, which is about a 55% increase over the control. And for rhododendron, um, we increase them anywhere from 130 to 180% above the control. Um, so the response to nitrogen and phosphorus depends on carbon quality. The lowest quality resource responded, the magnitude change was much higher. Um, and the responses to nitrogen and phosphorus, as you can see with the 0 0.002 for maple and the 0 0.008 versus the 0 0.002 are relatively similar. So N and P are both important. A little bit more importance of um, of uh, N than for P for rhododendron, but basically they're similar. Um, but the magnitude difference is much greater for rhododendron than for red maple. What's interesting about this, um, a European Union study by Guy Woodward and others looked at like 100 and some streams across 12 countries that have distinct differences in dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in the water. They did a similar study, much larger scale, of course, and in natural ecosystems with oak and alder leaves. Alder is really fast decomposing into nitrogen fixers, high quality. Oak is more recalcitrant. And they used um, microbial access and invertebrate and microbial access. We call it fine mesh and coarse mesh. And what they found was that when consumers were present, that the highest rates of breakdown rate on the y-axis corresponded with intermediate levels of NNP. They were operating in systems that had much higher nitrogen. European streams are much higher in nitrogen generally than, than North American streams. Um, and what they concluded was is that the higher concentration of NNP inhibited macro consumers and vertebrates because oftentimes those corresponded with other land use activities such as urbanization or agriculture that are detrimental to, to larger body consumers. But the microbes sort of don't really care um, per se. But that net effect is highest or peak breakdown rates at intermediate NNP. So what our work does is takes a much smaller range of NNP and just focuses on the microbes. And we saw that they were increasing breakdown rates with N and P, and that there wasn't a peak, per se. Um, what's interesting about the N to P ratio, so this is just that same <coughs> experimental design figure, the greater than 16 to 1, less than, and 16 to 1. And you can see that generally N to P ratio doesn't, this is the, the mean breakdown rates at the top. And essentially what those translate into um, is about you know, 1 to 2% mass loss per day. They're kind of the same. Uh, they're not that great. And so N to P ratio didn't seem to have as much of an impact as N or P concentration for microbial breakdown rates. So that's something that's interesting to note as we move into the next um, section of the study. Um, what this shows is the general trends in mass loss, so y-axis is breakdown rate, and then um, the log of nitrogen. This, the blue is the red maple, the black is the rhododendron. And these are bubble plots that show increasing concentration of phosphorus. Um, and you can look at these in some really cool ways to assess where 
the um, phosphorus concentration might have stimulated the addition of nitrogen. So larger size bubbles correspond with larger phosphorus concentration. Um, and in general, they're both sort of behaving similarly. You don't see this clustering of low P with high N or high P with high N. Um, they're just kind of scattered throughout, but an increasing effect of N and P on that breakdown rate for both species. Um, higher effect in maple than rhododendron. And this is the same, but looking at phosphorus on the x-axis and varying concentration of nitrogen with bubble plots. And they're, they're pretty similar. So N and P are both important. There's not really um, an interaction per se that's uh, attributed to the concentration of P or N, but both N and P concentrations as they increase, increase mass loss of carbon for these different species. I'm gonna move through the stoichiometric responses. So the changes in the carbon to nitrogen or carbon to phosphorus ratios that we measured at different time points, so at the beginning of the breakdown period and towards the end of the study, um, fungi and bacteria start to colonize these leaves and they they have strong responses initially, especially the fungi, and then they tend to taper. So it's, it's important to make these measurements through time. Well, what we found, um, looking the blue again is, is uh, maple and the black is rhododendron. On day 14, litter carbon and nitrogen ratios are different, but not really explained by dissolved nutrients, dissolved nitrogen. But by the end of the study, after two months, um, rhododendron breakdown rates, or ro rhododendron C to N, uh, lower C to N means more N because the carbon stays the same. So rhododendron biofilms associated with rhododendron were taking up that nitrogen and drawing down the litter C to N ratio. And that's why you see that decrease through the black points, but not through the blue points. So it didn't respond significantly with red maple, but it did for that low quality carbon rhododendron. Same day 14, day 59, C to P of leaves, however, the fungi that start colonizing really early in decomposition, they were able to take up that phosphorus pretty quickly um, for both leaf species. And so what you have here is a preferential, I mean, the inference here is that microbes are preferentially taking up P over N, which is what we would sort of expect given that P is more limiting. But here, carbon, carbon quality was less of a factor because they responded on both leaf types. But towards the end of the study, that response was still occurring on the low quality leaves and um, had more normalized on the higher quality maple. Okay. Well, now we're putting the big juice into the big rivers or the big streams as they were. And so we were adding for two years, continuously added ammonium nitrate and phosphoric acid. So the same uh, phosphoric acids in Coca-Cola. Um, it's really caustic. I've spilled it on my clothes a lot. Um, we would dose continuously in five streams along that end of P ratio of two to one up to 128 to one. So this is um, the same aerial photo, Google image, of, um, that was on my cover slide. Uh, this is the Little T, Little Tennessee River Valley in North Carolina. Um, basically, it's south of uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, and it's obviously quite forested and, and mountainous. So we found five headwater streams at the same elevation and same aspect. Um, measured them for a year before enrichment and measured them for two years during enrichment. A whole host of measurements, some of which I'll talk about today. But here's our gradient of N to P ratio that we were targeting. So what we were doing is dosing flow proportionally. So at high flow, we would add more nitrogen and phosphorus. At low flow, we would add less to maintain um, baseline nutrient chemistry and our added nutrients above baseline. So we were measuring baseline for a year um, throughout seasons and then we dosed 
across those two years based on baseline, above baseline for nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, what I'm going to show today are nutrient response ratios. So I generally wanted to look at the change in the experimental response relative to the control. And in this sense, because we're working in five ecosystems and um, we were running them first for one year and then enriched for two years, the control is the pre-enrichment and the experimental are year one and year two of enrichment. So um, a response ratio of zero indicates no change because it's natural law. Um, if it's less than one, there's a neg or less than zero, there's a negative effect. And if it's greater than zero, it's a positive effect. And then you can run statistics to see if it's significant or not. So just note that when you see these numbers, the log response ratio, I'll point out the ones that were responding strongly. So again, our targeted concentration or ratios along concentrations, two to one, 128 to one, it's still hard to get N to P ratios spot on um, in whole systems because biogeochemical processes preferentially, as you saw, preferentially take up phosphorus over nitrogen and there's sorption, abiotic sorption. But in general, we have this nice gradient in N to P ratio. Um, this is a platform with our data loggers and intake pipe basically just siphoning water into settling tanks, a pump, hooked into carboys of our soup, our ammonium nitrate and phosphoric acid soup that was concentrated and it was injected into a drip line that ran 70 meters along each of the five streams. So our targeted and our measured um, are different, but, but pretty good in terms of a gradient of NDP. So the next set of figures that I'm going to show you are all going to have the same pattern. Gray is pre-enrichment, or the control, in terms of the log response ratio. Red is year one. Blue is year two of enrichment. And when I show the log response ratio, it's going to be on the enrichment side. So this figure just shows the pre-treatment leaf carbon standing stocks. So we went into these streams every month, randomly selected transects from 0 to 70 meters, and collected all the leaves that were on the bottom of the stream. And you can see that there's some, this is seasonal. I'm going to show it seasonally, and then I'm going to show it per stream. You can see that there's some seasonal variation, and there's a lot of variation in the fall. Those leaves come in, they're decomposed, or they're exported pretty quickly. Some of them are retained. And as you get into the spring and summer, there's a lot less and that which is there stays, um, presumably because it's more recalcitrant, like that rhododendron. <coughs> we add nitrogen and phosphorus, and in year one, we see not much of a change in the fall. We started in the summer dosing, and then the response in the fall wasn't that different in terms of leaf standing stock. By winter, it was decreased significantly. Um, by spring and summer, log response ratios indicate there is a significant reduction in standing stock of leaves relative to the pre-enrichment year. So that's the energy base of these systems, and it drops way down. Year two, it gets even lower, except there is a legacy from year one, and so the amount of standing stock in the fall is lower, not significantly, but by winter, spring, and summer, that carbon base is a, a dominant carbon base is super low. Okay. So the system specific, these are the N to P ratios, which correspond to one of five streams. The same y-axis, standing stock of leaves, pre-enrichment, pre versus year one. Um, there's a decline more in the two to one N to P. Low N to P means relatively higher phosphorus. That higher phosphorus was what we saw the microbes were responding to in the stream channel study. They took that up preferentially over nitrogen. So we think that that's a, a strong indicator of the pathway of response here is uh, microbial uptake and specifically fungal uptake of phosphorus, which our colleague, Vlad Goulas, the one that was playing around in the stream channels at the beginning, 
has measured the stoichiometry of the fungal tissue. He's a mycologist and has found that fungi actually preferentially take up pee and store it, kind of like luxury uptake that is noted in, in biofilms and algae. So by year two, end of pee, two to one, super strong response, but there's increasing responses in the low, I'll say the low end of pee, so the sub, the 32 and lower end of pee. So that, end, that phosphorus that gets taken up over time, and there's more of that phosphorus at lower end of pee, is stored, presumably, or at least it's retained to some extent in the system. And this could indicate sort of a, a phosphorus loading legacy from year one to year two, which is manifesting itself in responses that are significant in some of these higher end of P ratios, where we still get that significant response in the end of P two to one. So if we look at carbon that comes in from the forest is just one source and leaves are just one size fraction. There's fine particulate matter that we were not measuring. There's dissolved organic and inorganic carbon that we weren't measuring. But one of the other basal resources in a system like a stream are algae. Algae or biofilms grow all over. Um, they don't grow very much in this system uh, because it's shaded, but and you can see these levels are super duper low. There's some seasonal variation. Winter and spring, it's lower. Summer and fall, it's higher, um, coincident with light and temperature. Well, when we dosed, we didn't see a response in biofilm. Uh, this is in carbon, grams carbon per meter squared. We didn't see a response until spring and summer. And we started getting what we called algal balloons, which you guys would laugh at, but they were just little bits of what we think are this uh, facultative blue-green called lingvia. And it was really, I don't want to give it away, but it was really responding to the low end of P. After year two, or during year two, that same response in the spring was significant, not in the summer. Um, and a lot of that, we think, has to do with the high flow in late spring that we had in the system. It was a super wet summer up there, and a lot of that biofilm just gets sloughed. But your biofilm includes fungi also. It does. Protists and, yep. Yeah, protists and real. Exactly. Okay. Good, good point. So I'm going to segue into that because what you can do is you can, no, you're right on it. And you can get, this is the total carbon of the community, of that microbial community. You can look at the chlorophyll to carbon ratios as a surrogate of autotrophic production. So I'll, I'll show you some of the little data here in a minute. Um, and here again, it's just the different streams. How did they respond? End of P ratios. Well, there was more of a seasonal response than there was a stream specific <coughs> response. Um, these systems are nutrient limited in general. You add a little bit of nitrogen and phosphorus and they respond. In this case, the biofilm didn't seem to respond to the ratio, but just the enrichment. And again, that end of P response is not very different. Um, in, it's not significant in year two at all in terms of total carbon of the biofilm. Here's the chlorophyll. So this is the pigment for, for plants, super low in pre-enrichment. In the summer, spring and summer, but mostly summer of year one, we see pretty dramatic increases in our chlorophyll concentrations uh, per meter squared compared to pre. And again, we see that large peak in spring of year two that goes away in summer of year two, um, although it's still significant, but the, there's a lot of variation associated with those peaks. But um, the algae were photosynthesizing. The biofilms were, most, were responding mostly autotrophic response. So light was not as limiting to them as phosphorus. Um, and then this is the same pattern, just looking at it at the different streams. And we don't see um, a super strong response, although N to P that was actually higher, the 128 to one, initially had a response in year one, and in year two, the N to P ratios uh, didn't seem to have an impact. 
So we've got some interesting lines of evidence, um, some autotrophic response where we believe that fungi are taking up preferentially phosphorus relative to nitrogen, and some autotrophic response where algae, the component of biofilm that is super low in uh, these systems, um, became elevated, still low, but elevated uh, above baseline. So what, what I have here are different percent nitrogen on the Y and then the different treatment streams, 2 through 128, the pre-year 1 and year 2. And these are just stacked bar graphs with the response ratios of pre-year 1 comparison, year 2, and pre-comparison for each of the streams. For nitrogen, in paraphyton or biofilm, let's just say, and in leaf litter. So what I wanted to see was how does the nitrogen and phosphorus concentration of these basal resources, the low abundant um, algae and the high abundant leaf litter, algae being mostly autotrophic as we saw, I mean the, the biofilm being mostly autotrophic and the detritus being predominantly heterotrophic. So for nitrogen, there are some increases. Uh, it's not none of which are significant. There's more of a response to the, the paraffin or the biofilm uptake. Um, but year one and year two enrichment don't seem to vary that much. For leaves, there's not much of a change. For phosphorus, there is. So again, there's that suggested loading effect. Um, the responses are strongest at lower end of P's, so where there's more P. Um, and, and it's more prominent in the paraffin or the biofilm, but not so much uh, in the um, leaf litter itself. That could explain in some cases that there's more turnover of that leaf material and more retention of that phosphorus in the, in the algae or in the biofilm than there is on the leaf surface, which is really interesting. Um, but not sure what the mechanism is explaining there but just knowing, showing that really biofilm retained phosphorus over time, that there was a loading effect. Okay, I'm gonna now just segue into the functionality of those responses. So I built the framework here of here's what we dosed, here's what the basal resources responded to, and now I wanna see if there's an integrated ecosystem impact. So one of the ways that you can do that is through measurements of whole system metabolism. And as I indicated earlier, that metabolism in these systems is driven predominantly by respiration. Um, so I'm just gonna show respiration in the next two slides. Um, but we are actually um, modeling the data to look at the, the autotrophic response, the photosynthetic response. And we're sure it's gonna be really low. <laughs> Um, so here we've just got a setup where we did a two-station method, upstream, downstream, constrained by the treatment area of, of the streams that we were dosing. And then we bubbled in a tracer gas, um, uh, sulfur hexafluorine, to look at the reoration, the gas loss, um, and gas replacement, the gas exchange, that naturally occur in these streams that are really shallow and um, pretty turbulent and cold. So this oxygen, that gas flux is a proxy for gas exchange, oxygen exchange, since we're measuring oxygen. And um, we had really great relationships between that exchange rate of oxygen <coughs> and velocity, which um, is also related to the turbulence or affects the turbulence of the water. So in the summer, spring, late spring and fall, we get good measurements of respiration. In the winter, when the water level is flowing pretty fast and it's cold, we just can't measure. Um, we can't measure metabolism because the reoration rates are higher than the biological signature. So we don't get a response. So the two figures here are similar to the ones I showed before, um, except the bubble plots correspond to N to P ratio in the treatment streams. So this is the pre before we started dosing, and this is year one in red. So pre in black and year one in red. We dosed, I mean, before we dosed, we 
took seasonal measurements of the metabolism in these systems. Um, so the bubbles don't really correspond to anything because we weren't dosing. So just sort of forget about the size of the bubbles in this left figure. But what is apparent is that the standing stock of organic matter, of leaves in this case, is explaining ecosystem respiration rate. So in the fall, when there's a lot of leaves that come in, so higher leaf standing stock, the respiration rates, so the increasing respiration is a uh, in increasing negative consumption of oxygen, so that's why it goes down here on the Y, inverse axis. Um, when we have a lot of leaves, we have a lot of heterotrophic activity. Um, when we dosed, we got even stronger or higher rates of respiration, ecosystem respiration, at much lower standing stocks of leaves. And this axis is totally wrong. I'm not sure where these numbers came from, but um, they should be more in line with like from zero to 200 grams of carbon per meter squared. So we reduced our carbon base and we increased our respiration rate. So when you add nitrogen and phosphorus to these systems, even though they're consuming a lot of that carbon, you can enhance the net respiration of the system until that system becomes carbon limited. And this is the same figure as before for pre, but year two, um, that attenuated. And presumably, we reduced that carbon base significantly, and the system wasn't able to respire as high. And that's why those rates of the blue are much lower than the red. So we can look at the same patterns seasonally. And here I just wanted to show, this is respiration rate, the same measurement that we had in the previous slide, same range. Pre, it's higher in the fall relative to spring and summer. We can't do winter. We add nutrients, we enhance respiration, and that response is, is quite high in both fall and then um, significantly higher in, in spring and summer though from pre. Much less response in year two, although there was still a high response in the summer of year two. And if we look at this across the N to P ratio of the streams, we can see that that two to one increased and there was a lot less variation in the response. But at N to P's 16 to one and 128 to one, there was a lot more variation in respiration, sort of similar to the variation in respiration that we would see in these systems before we started dosing. So when you add nutrients, you homogenize the resource base. Those leaves that come into the system have different N to P ratios from one another, and they're quite large, the variation. They have different carbon qualities, which are quite large. But when you add nutrients, you kind of level the playing field a lot. Um, but in this case, the N to P ratio influenced how much of that variation there was in the system. Um, and in this case, the 2 to 1 had much less variation in respiration. Similar uh, response, a little bit of variation, a little bit of difference between year 2, um, but much, much reduced response in total respiration. So these are just different ways of looking at the same data. Um, in the systems. So nutrients, both N and P, stimulated the microbial and ecosystem metabolism, microbial responses in mass loss that I showed earlier, and the net ecosystem respiration in the system that I just showed. Um, there's indications of both N and P limitation. However, there is um, strong evidence to suggest that phosphorus is preferentially taken up by microbes that that phosphorus uptake is not retained as much in the leaf litter, the dominant carbon base, as it is in the biofilm, mostly driven by algae. But the magnitude response of algae and or the mag magnitude carbon mass in, in biofilm is much less, like seven times less than that of leaves. So is it, is it significant? Well, as a net respiratory effect, we, we do see seasonal signatures of enhanced respiration that we would attribute to the biofilm 
because when you have reduced carbon in the summer and this increase in biofilm in the summer, um, we saw increases in respiration, at least in the first year of enrichment. Um, so the whole system, leaf carbon uh, gets reduced, but the biofilm increases, and that there's an a, a impact to that on, of season on that. One of the biggest unknowns and one of the largest drivers of breakdown rates in ecosystems are the metazoans, the larger body consumers. And we didn't deal with those in this particular part of the study, but they are being dealt with. Um, and in particular, folks are looking at the threshold elemental ratios where one nutrient, nitrogen relative to carbon, phosphorus relative to carbon, shifts in its limitation. And so, when we added nitrogen and phosphorus, if we see that certain organisms are becoming more limited by carbon when we add P at a certain end of P ratio, it might explain some of these uh, idiosyncrasies that we're seeing um, in net effects. So this goes over the initial slide, um, or initial predictions, that really, we saw increased heterotrophy, increased metabolism, driven by the microbes, and we're measuring that at both the microbial scale and the ecosystem scale. We saw that carbon loss in the microbial scale of the stream mesocosms, and we saw it at the ecosystem scale. That was effect with those changes in litter stoichiometry explain that it was a microbial response because increased N or P changed C to P <laughs> ratios or C to N ratios and that's the microbes colonizing that organic matter. So that's great. Um, and what we need to do is understand better how uh, these systems are responding to carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus along productivity gradients. So I showed you sort of an extreme ecosystem example of a very heterotrophic system. And we know initially a lot less about those systems than we do in more productive systems. Um, and so more of um, understanding of how the responses in our system translate or, or are variable compared to the responses in other systems is, is important, especially given the fact that we are reducing terrestrial carbon and therefore warming streams and reducing their terrestrial carbon input. So there's a lot of work that needs to go into understanding how much of a landscape can maintain the metabolism of a stream or river when we reduce carbon, increase temperature, and add nutrients. So those remain unknowns generally. And as you can see from where we were focusing, our, our nitrogen didn't get up above a thousand. Our phosphorus got up to just around a hundred. There's a lot more variation in the U.S. alone in nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in our waters. Um, and so what we've shown here represents a fraction of the larger uh, national water database, national water um, assessment. So I want to thank the funding sources and the labor and you for listening, but I want to just segue for two minutes into some ideas that I have for research here that is uh, developing, and then I'll leave some time for questions. Um, one of, so there's going to be a bunch of little pictures of people, and up at the top is going to be the objective. So one of the objectives that we've started to work on um, with Steve Davis and Ev Geyser and Tiffany Troxler and others are looking at sea level rise impacts on plant soil carbon dynamics in mangrove uh, ecosystems. And Shelby Service, my PhD student, uh, worked down at the Florida Bay Interagency Science Center this summer with an REU, Julio Pachon, and they maintained a, a six-week, 42-day experiment of red <laughs> mangrove seedlings well, young red mangrove plants um, under different conditions of phosphorus and disturbance. So they basically added P to the soil and cut off all the leaves on um, some of the trees. So um, this is measurements of CO2 flux 
from the soil in response to those different uh, treatments, and then these are the different weeks. Um, and <coughs> results are in development. Um, these results are, are pretty inconclusive, but uh, there w wasn't really a strong impact on the soil carbon loss. Um, but we're investigating the below ground uh, decomposition. Shelby's looking at leaf and root changes uh, in decomp and the uh, overall growth of the plants. Um, my other student, Sean Charles, uh, and I are collaborating with Anna Armitage and Steve Pennings. Um, Anna's at uh, UT Galveston, and Steve's at University of Houston. And they got a, a NOAA Sea Grant to um, maintain the densities of black mangroves in coastal Texas. And so this picture here um, shows mangroves that have invaded into a salt marsh in Port Aransas, Texas. And then there's pe there are people down there, and they've gone through and they've created open and closed patches, 100% closed or 100% open along this gradient from zero to 100%. Um, and Sean is really, Sean and I are interested in looking at the abiotic and biotic drivers of the invasive mangroves and the effects of that on the ecosystem storage and flux from the system. And just being down there a couple weeks ago, you could see very clear differences in um, the elevational gradient where they had cleared all the mangroves. It was the same, looked like the same elevation. The tides come in and totally surround all of the vegetation and, and distribute that sediment. Whereas in the areas where there are mangroves, there's that nice ridge at the um, edge of the coast and lots of different microclimactic differences that this figure shows changes in air temperature as you increase mangroves, air temperature goes up. We're interested in what happens to the soil temperature and the carbon turnover. And incidentally, birds love those patches and they come in and they forage and they poop and there's a phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, Evelyn and Joel and I are working on a proposal to be submitted to Ecosystems Panel at NSF that's looking at salinity and phosphorus dynamics along the freshwater and the ligohaline ecosystems um, and looking at changes in basically paraphyton uh, carbon and translating impacts up to food webs and ecosystems, um, food web energetics. And so some of the work that we're predicting to uh, test, and hopefully we'll get the ability to test, um, will track the benthic decline in complexity of paraphyton and its response through through food webs. I'm going to skip over this last one to go to the last one, which is a collaboration I'm working on with Chris McBoy and Jim Brock. Um, we're out in WCA 3A. Um, they built a tower. Uh, to look at flock transport, um, looking at flow using these really fine resolution uh, heat flow sensors. And I've gone out and put some uh, along gradients from the ridge to the, into the slough in different habitats at different depths, bottom, mid-depth, surface layer, um, DO probes. And you can see here just some preliminary data from um, a slough habitat that has a lot of flock associated with it, a lot of utricularia that's trapping that flock. Down towards the bottom, the DO just goes down completely. So we put it in and it gets, you know, sucked up. All the DO goes away. I pull it out, it goes right back up. Temperature is more consistent, obviously. And at mid depth versus at surface depth. And what we're trying to understand is what are the mechanisms for stratification in um, metabolism in these different habitats that could be sort of functional benchmarks for restoration of the Everglades. So if these behave a certain way, these systems behave a certain way, might we be able to test metabolic responses in restored systems? And could these be benchmarks for that restoration effort? And I'm officially done. Thanks for your attention. I know it was a lot, so, um, but I wanted to, more than anything, I wanted to tell you sort of where I'm coming from.
scientifically and open the door for opportunities for collaboration here at FIU. What's the temporal resolution on the... Um, yeah, these are um, every five minutes, and so I just put them out. This was out for a month. A month. Yeah. Um, and so that's the daily fluctuation. That's correct, yeah. The that's the daily fluctuation. Um, and I've got them out in sort of more bedrock slough areas, too, that don't have a lot of utricularia. And then I have them right on the ridge edge. And then I have one that's by the weather station um, at mid-depth in, in the slough here. So where this picture was taken is um, a platform where there's a weather station. So just beginning. Jen? Um, can you go back to the slide that had the sort of really interesting the, the nutrients with all the systems? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I think you have, yeah. yeah. So from your data, uh -huh. the, the ratios didn't matter that much, right? Right, as far as the, the microbial and ecosystem yeah. responses. So the N2P really didn't affect breakdown rates of the, the microbial breakdown rates of leaves. Do you think, um, it, do you think it's a general pattern that applies when you go outside the range of numbers? Well, I mean, we we didn't we stayed within yeah, well within yeah, the range, totally. like in our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the yeah, the point being is is that how would these systems at all be able to function if we dose them even higher, or would it be an, an, an more of a, a stress than a subsidy? Um, it's a good question. Um, that the work that Guy Woodward and others did in Europe suggests that it is a subsidy stress response, and we don't see it as clearly as that. Um, they weren't dosing, and they were just measuring along these um, end of P gradients that are concomitant with other stressors. So we were trying to isolate the the end of P. Um, part of it and measure the C part of it. And um, what we are tasked with, and my short answer is, is I don't really know. Um, I'm trying to come around to how can I take what we've done in these systems and say, here's what management should look at. Um, especially since we saw very strong responses at very low, relatively low concentrations. Um, I think that there's still a lot to be done with normalizing the NNP stoichiometry from these types, these maybe other types of studies. And I know that um, there are folks that are working on a large meta-analysis of nutrient enrichment, but at concentrations and not ratios. And I think the ratio component of it would be a good thing to build in um, to say, don't worry about the ratios, or you should worry about the ratios if it gets below red field. That's a good question. Yeah, Ed? Um, I was wondering how the community is responding to your timing of um, a great deal of pea stimulation, both in the algae and the fungi in the system. And, you know, that's so counter to the history of what we've understood happens. Yeah. Lower right, right, right. Um, we haven't published it yet, so, um, but the sort of the, the first paper to come out will be with the fungal stoichiometric responses mm -hmm. that show that fungi preferentially take, this is like lab ketostats. Yeah, okay. um, so it, it hasn't been published yet, and the goal is to get that out to sort of say, well, here's the here's the response pathway for the heterotropes, and here's the evidence that we have. Um, but I think it will be, uh, it'll be you know, a discovery that people are gonna say they support or they don't. It's kind of controversial. Yeah, well, I think you have, your evidence for it is, is fantastic. I just think that it is gonna kind of cause people to reconsider their ideas about the effects of phosphorus in yeah. these kinds of systems. Yeah. Um, that are typically a little bit more on the right of that axis, 
Yep. Um, and that was thinking about what you would find if you manipulated ratios like down here where you're in that lower left corner yeah, of exactly. around, you know, hundreds, you know, and right. And um, you know, you you could go to the left even quite a bit more, more. <laughs> and, and um, play with that here exactly. and yeah. see whether or not you find that same sort of response that you saw at these incredible low ratios of right. two to, you know. Yeah, two to one, yeah. the fact that we were able to maintain that. Right. Um, those, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think that what we would notice there, I mean, it would be really cool to do a response surface similar to the cross gradient of um, you know, even lower and or higher end of P ratios, but looking at just more fine or tight resolution P um, along that, that gradient. But I initially what we were hoping to do was be able to define thresholds um, more like a Michaelis Menton, and we didn't see it. Um, and it's possible that we missed it because it was sort of like the response was all up here. Um, and so since we were going from 0 to 10 and didn't go in between, we might have missed uh, a great deal of change that occurred within that P. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Any question from North Carolina? Thank you very much for sticking around an extra five minutes and um, thanks again.